Good evening and welcome back to another live episode of Red Tinted Glasses here on the Red Tinted Glasses YouTube channel. And what a Monday live we've got in store for you today because we spoke about in the preview, could Aberdeen take the step up and show how far they've really progressed? And boy, did Barry Robson prove any doubters, not looking at ourselves in particular there, Callum, wrong as the Reds romp to a 3-1 victory at Ibrox over a rather rugged Rangers. On the live tonight, we'll be looking back at that victory on Saturday over Rangers, probably in the first 30 to 45 minutes of the show, um, and incorporating to the end of that chat uh, our thoughts ahead of the HJK Helsinki game on Thursday night. After that, I'll be joined by Finnish sports journalist Ari Vertanen to look ahead to the game uh, against um, Helsinki. That's a bit about a, about a 27 minute segment for those on audio that are, are tuning in. Um, hopefully, um, our lags aren't um, as ever present as they were on the last episode, but the joys of doing a live show. So, if there is any kind of awkward gaps, hopefully, Cal's not left himself on mute um, and it is just um, a small lag. But, Callum, you said on that preview um, uh, episode, Rangers are there for the taking. Johnny Main said, God, what is he doing? How proud do you feel today? I'm delighted. I stuck uh, I stuck to my beliefs. I stuck true to my guns and uh, proved correct. I'm a bit shocked about it. Um, so we'll see how long it is again before I get something right. But... You had, had a good feeling, you know, dodgy bit of form. We have a that. We have turned a corner and their fans growing ever more irate. And uh, we seemed to get on top of things, most of it. And we tried, said we should try and keep it tight, see if we can use the crowd uh, to turn them against them. And boy, did it work, Glenn. It, it really did. And I actually kind of listened back because I was trying to clip up some of the, the comments that um, you made in that, that preview to, to show tonight. But for um, some reason, when I was playing about on StreamYard earlier, it wasn't really letting me save um, the comments. But kind of listening back to what we said in, in that preview, almost the game plan almost kind of happened word for word. I think our only fear... Um, pre-match was the, the refereeing performance and to be honest it really has to be said that Stephen McLean um, ha had an excellent game didn't bow to the the baying pressure that, the, that was probably coming down off the, the sidelines although that's maybe more aimed at um, Michael Beale um, but you know we spoke about keeping it tight the first 20 minutes I know Rangers TV said if it had been a boxing match that Aberdeen should throw in the towel um, that was after just nine minutes um, it, it was an imp impressive performance, albeit, as I said, you know, a, a rather shaky start um, that opening 10, 15 minutes. But we grew into the game. We grew confident. We got the first goal. Uh, and once you get the first goal, the crowd did turn in. Uh, and thankfully, things continued to go right for us as well. And um, we'll, we'll get in more into it play by play uh, as we go through the episode. But Callum, again, we spoke about changes and you mentioned about you know, having max three changes, and that's what we did. It was the same starting eleven that lined up against Frankfurt. Look, they put in an excellent performance uh, over in Germany, albeit it didn't get the result. And um, got two for two uh, on Saturday, both performance and result, and and you can't argue that both were thoroughly deserved. Absolutely not. I mean, we sort of alluded to the fact that that well, maybe that was how they were going to set up. Um, given you know the way we played against Frankfurt uh, and the shape that that we well, that we played, it was the exact same starting eleven, even down to a T. And I felt we carried things out a lot better. And um, you know against Frankfurt the first time, sort of we were trying to play that way, uh, and it, it went relatively well. We didn't get the end result, but you could see that there was improvement there as well uh, on Saturday in terms of. When we did have the ball, okay, Rangers had the line share of the ball, whatever. They missed a fair few chances, and oh boy, did they. But when we had the ball, we made excellent, excellent use of it. I think we hit this target six times, three of them hit in the back of the net. And I don't think that's including all of those block shots uh, in the build-up to McGrath's goal either. 
No, exactly. And and that's the thing as well. We, we spoke about being clinical um, in the game and, you know, we didn't need to spend multi-millions to, to bolster our, our front line to, um, you know, sign utter dross. Um, and and I, I guess the thing is as well, Miofsky doesn't even, even get a goal. Neither are any of our strikers uh, don't score. It's two defenders uh, and a midfielder who we signed on a free. Um, so... Um, pretty impressive and look that that first kind of opening stages I was like oh no you know we've kind of resorted to tactics that we didn't want to see I think it was VK in the comments on on the last episode said I hope we don't kind of um, resort to hoofball and I kind of felt we were in that opening exchange just bypassing the, the the midfield a little bit but look we got things down we we started controlling the game and it, and it Good to see because a lot of the time, Calm, when we've spoken about playing Rangers, we've maybe said we gave them too much respect. We stood off them. And again, I said about going there, I think we both agreed that if we turned up and took the game to Rangers, we could cause the problems and we kind of had nothing to fear. And it really showed there was nothing to fear. And I'm so glad we're sitting here speaking about a well-earned three points. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we we certainly grew into the game. You you could tell, you know, in, in the opening first twenty minutes, Rangers had plenty of chances, and they were definitely in control. Absolutely. However, the fact we didn't cave, we still made it sort of difficult for them. They had to earn those chances. Thankfully, they did not take them, and boy, did they really, really, really fuck some of them up. And um, Cyril Dessers, in particular, I'm looking at you, but. We stayed resolute. We stuck to the game plan. We got exactly what we wanted out of them. And we, we made them pay, ultimately. Yeah, we did. There was one maybe kind of incident in the opening exchanges um, as well where um, John Lundstrom caught Jamie McGrath with a, with a stray elbow. Was there much in that for you? Because to be honest, when I was watching, I personally didn't think there was much intention, but I know that kind of split opinion on social media when it happened and obviously that's why Jamie McGrath had his war wound that he had for um, the goal later I don't think there was any intent really from Joel Lundstrom have, having said that you have seen players you know do the same thing and receive uh, be on the end of bookings or sometimes even red cards um, ah, no real complaints for me but it did look a very very sore one so credit to Jamie McGrath too uh, carrying on and uh, carrying on to good effect. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's great to have a lot of you um, joining us tonight here on the on the live. Um, and maybe not all of you stay for the whole show, but Johnny, I'm glad you can um, admit you're happy to, to be so wrong. Um, I, I'm saving a lot of the comments that, that are coming um, through. Um, because um, we'll be kind of talking about some of the stuff you guys are commenting on throughout the show, so um, stay tuned for that. And uh, I'm glad Darren noticed that um, I am being very childish and wrote Rangers tears on my pint of water that I'm drinking. And yes, those tears are going down superbly, so delicious, a little bit salty, but um, I am very much enjoying it. And I think a lot of Aberdeen fans um, have been reveling in that um, today at work. I sent every Rangers fan an email to say that I was wearing all black in remembrance of Michael Beale sadly departing Scottish football. And if anyone wanted to hold a minute's silence with me, then feel free. But thanking him for his memories, because of course, um, two out of two um, for Barry uh, against Rangers as well. So uh, absolutely ideal. And I was really enjoying kind of some of the responses um, to that as well. But come, as I said, we grew into the game um, against them. We were causing problems, but... I think the biggest thing as well, we were causing frustration amongst the, the support, but also the, the Rangers players. I think you, you, you spoke about the stats a moment ago. You just need to look at how many fouls Rangers gave up in that game. They gave up 14 fouls, more fouls than us, um, which I'm sure some of their fan base will, will not be happy about. But look, <laughs> that's maybe the tactics we got. We were we were very clever. Um, I think we've spoken about coming up against maybe more experienced oppositions. Um, I've used the word streetwise before and I think we were very streetwise 
um, on Saturday. I look at Graham Shinney in particular when he kind of was winning the ball on the edge of, of our box and looking to take it out. Anytime there was a bit of contact, straight down. And thankfully, we had a strong referee um, and we were getting those decisions as well, which helped. It is mad that we're sitting here giving credit to Scottish officials in a game against yeah. Rangers at Ibrox. What is going on? I feel like we're in dreamland. But um, it's interesting you mentioned that they, they had more fouls than us. I did notice that. Not very negative from us, is it, Michael Beale? Mm-hmm. Seems like your side being a little bit negative, trying to bake up the play when we're trying to play football. What's that about? What's that about? But it is good to see us being streetwise. And it's something that I think will massively help us in European competition as well. Because how many times over the years have you seen, well, Scottish teams in general, I suppose, um, sort of failing to combat or being able, been able to, unable to deal with and sort of getting frustrated with European sides who are very much streetwise, especially to, to other officials, which which maybe you know teams aren't used to and we're certainly not used to uh, if they're from the continent. So it's good to see that. That's definitely coming from Barry. You'd feel like a man, a very experienced man uh, in the arts and uh, hopefully uh, more of that to come. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And also when it when it comes to, to games against Celtic and Rangers, whether it be home or away, we always hear from a, a player in the press talking up our chances and, you know, probably a, a rallying cry to the support to really get us going pre-match. And, um this week was Stefan Gartman's chance to have his um, say for a, a rally and call it a player that's kind of come in and really, you know, like loan players tend to do, buy into um, the city and buy into the, the passion of the, the, the club so much. And God damn it, we're falling in love with loan players all over again with, with Stefan. But he said he wanted a victory to lift the fans and the city. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard it all before. Here we go. Well, talk about talking the talk, then walking the walk as he grabbed his first Don's goal by very well-worked corner routine to, to lose Sifuentes um, and stab the ball beyond Jack Butlin into the back of the net. And I'm sure those that were in their way end were going absolutely crazy. I can imagine. So, I mean, and you mentioned walking the walk. That's basically all Stefan Gartenman had to do to get in at the back post and be wide open to prod home. A goal that I thought he took actually very well, not only to, to sort of create the space for himself, um, but also the fact it's sort of on the bounce as he as he meets it. Um, the delivery from Leighton Clarkson. And he went on to I'm really glad for him because he has been excellent so far since coming in. And... Um, it's just, it is a slippery slope about loving a lone player, isn't it? But it's nice to see, he seems to get it, he's buying in. Okay, he might be saying all the things we want to hear, but when he can back it up, I don't care. Exactly, and as Dave McLennan says, can't love a lone player still getting over Matty, but Stefan's really probably posing the question, Matty who? Um, just now with um, that kind of consistent performances um, in recent weeks. A, a lot of a lot of people um, are are commenting on on Graham Shinney and uh, Michael Taylor saying that he was absolutely outstanding, covered every blade of grass, biting into the tackles and chasing loose balls. What a performance from Captain Fantastic! Uh, and a couple of other people kind of commenting on the fact that um, he he's looking a lot a lot fitter now. Um, again, Darren Cable as well, um, commenting on the the performance from from Graham Shinney as well, calling it outstanding. And that's again, you know, as well as as much as speaking about Stefan Gartman, what he's been kind of brought to the defense alongside Richard Jensen, this change of formation and bringing kind of Connor Barron into the team or Dante Polvara, as we saw on Saturday, has really freed up Graham Shinney over the, the course of these last four games as it is now. And we're almost seeing the best of Graham Shinney once again. Absolutely, we seem to be, which <laughs> once again, uh, sort of shoved it in our faces after we questioned whether he could yeah. play two games in a week, try three games in a week, uh, and we've won them all. So, I've, you know, I was, I was, a, I was a bit of a critic in, in the opening part of this season uh, towards Graham Shinney, but he has been excellent and excellent leader, driving the standards on the park. I'm sure he is uh, off it as well absolutely astounding from him once again 
and uh, you could tell he absolutely loved it. I remember I watched sports team back, and um, when he won a throw in, I think, or a corner down that side, noising up the away away fans right in front. And uh, look, he clearly does love it, and I'm just glad he's back to his best. Long may it continue. So he's uh, too old for two games a week, as David McLennan said. You called him out one. I just. I just said, I'll, you know, I accepted when I was wrong. In fact, he's been excellent three games in one week. So, Graham Shinney, I apologise. Good. Um, I guess there's going to be uh, apologies from, well, me, you, half of the Aberdeen Twitter um, fan base as well. Because, you know, every time the, the team news comes out, um, Jack McKenzie's name is probably the first one people look for to see whether it's there or not and probably the first name to be criticised if he is picked um, I, I think look hats off to Jack because it can be easy um, being a youngster and dealing with criticism coming from two specky idiots let alone the rest of the, the fan base as well um, but he ha- he's handled it really well um, but what a performance he put in on, on Saturday um, in that first half as well as the second half, which we're going to come on to in terms of his goal. But I think what epitomises his performance, but also epitomises what a lot of us expected um, from a Barry Robson team, was that tackle on Connor Goldson 90 seconds before half time, chasing down what, let's be honest, was an absolute worthless cause but putting Goldson under all sorts of pressure, winning the ball cleanly and making him eat a face full of grass. Superb commitment. And the reaction from Boyan, Dante in the bottom corner of the the clip as well, it's just superb. can tell how appreciated that was by his teammates, let alone the cheer that you heard um, from the Aberdeen fans. It was almost as loud as a goal as well. Won the ball, made goal to eat grass and won a throw in as well, very high up the park, keeping yeah. them out of harm's way as we edge toward half time. Um, and uh, it's exactly what you want. I think it was, it was Lee Mayer on commentary and he was saying, you know, complaining how much it is about the fact he's, you know, it, it, it's just, it's like honest football, ball down the line and, and he goes and fights the lost cause. He sprints 40 yards or something from his, he starts in his own half to chase that down. And it's the hunger and desire you want to see. And it keeps it sort of keeps momentum our way. I know it was, you know, close to half time, but that's right before half time. The fans will remember that. We're one 0 up and leading already. That gives them something else to, to get behind. And yeah, we've criticized Jack McKenzie, sometimes rightly so. Credit has to be given when it's due. Um absolutely outstanding. Uh, we'll come on to his goal later on, but really, really happy for him and um that sort of summed up the date, you feel like, that tackle. And as you see, Boyan running over to congratulate him. Dante giving it a little uh, Conor Barron-esque fist bump as well. Yeah. Just beautiful viewing. I've watched it maybe even more than the goals back <laughs> since. Yeah, uh, exactly. And I think, you know, you make a you make an excellent point because the point you made about, um, you know, the players will, will remember it, the fans will remember it as well. It... it it kind of goes back to, to momentum. I watched the Ryder Cup over the weekend and it seemed like every second word that came out of Paul McGinley's mouth was momentum. Um, and, you know, at, at the time when Jack McKenzie makes that challenge, Connor Goldson's probably thinking, right, I've got an easy clearance coming up. We're going to get into half time. You know, the mentality from an Aberdeen boys will probably be, they're one nil up, they'll tire in the, in the second half, I'm sure. But by chasing down that cause, by putting, that challenge that almost sent a message to the Rangers players the Rangers fans we're not here to be you know pushed over and have our tummies tickled like we've seen in um in previous years when we've gone down to Ibrox and you know our arses have collapsed we were here to kind of stand up to them and put up a put up a fight we weren't afraid to kind of bloody the nose um of them and, and that's what us as our Rean fans want to see from our team week in, week out, not just at, at places like Ibrox. Absolutely. And it was the fact that that channel, it wasn't stupid. Actually, it was incredibly sensible from him. He didn't just go in and clatter him. But the fact it was positive for us, it didn't give them possession. We had the ball. 
it, it was perfect, absolutely perfect. And as you say, it's exactly what you want to see. I mean, had we gone on to lose that game, whatever. If we fight like that, when we're going to Glasgow, whether it's Celtic Park or Ibrox, and put in effort like that, regardless of the result, then there won't be qualms or little mm-hmm. qualms. That's mm-hmm. exactly what you want out of an Aberdeen side. Okay, you know, um, Michael Beale said we should be losing to a team like Aberdeen. When they've spent that much money and they continue to do so on wages, no, they shouldn't. Yet that type of thing is the exact reason why they did. We wanted it more. Yeah, exactly. And and it was, it was that fight and desire. Um and I'm glad you know we got we got the right outcome um as well. But you know, it's that kind of sense of entitlement and the arrogance of the way he made that um that that comment um about we shouldn't be losing to, to teams like like Aberdeen that make victories like we had on, on Saturday all that all that much sweeter and it's it's quite ironic that um there's normally a few um fans of that club that um tune into our lives and uh, and we're certainly very noisy um uh, in the early stages of the season uh, after the, the Livingston game in, in particular but we've gone very quiet um after the wins against Ross County and um I haven't seen Jimmy in the in the comments tonight um must have probably searching who's best for next manager. Um, I'm sure he's keeping himself amused that way. Um, when we come up against Rangers, of course, there's always the, the pantomime villain in, in Ryan Jack. He, um, I was going to say, unfortunately, let's be honest, I'd be lying if I said that, um, had to go off due to injury at halftime, and he was replaced by fellow snake Scott Wright, um, who also um, became a pantomime villain and, and couldn't handle the heat um, against a really fiery Aberdeen side that um, in, in that second half. But look, we continued the momentum um, that we kind of ended the, the first half with and, and continued to get in the faces of, of Rangers. It, it should have really been 2-0. Um, Leighton Clarkson, as always, getting a delivery to, to Boyan Miofsky. But unfortunately for, for Boyan this weekend, he couldn't, but it looks easier to score. Um, hits the post and and clatters into it as well. Thankfully, though, doesn't come back to haunt us. No, it didn't. However, fantastic chance to create by Leighton Clarkson, and I like the determination from Boyan getting on the end of it and putting himself in harm's way. Unfortunately, we didn't score. I think regardless of the fact he clattered off the post, had it gone in, he would have somehow managed to get up and get abs- go absolutely torn to a hit towards the away end. But unfortunate, but as you say, thankfully it, it didn't matter. And how many times have we gone to Ibrox and you know you, you, or or Parkhead, Hamden, even one chance of particular where you think, oh, what if what if that had gone differently? Then you never know what would have happened. Thankfully, they didn't matter this time. The Reds are simply too good. Yeah, I know. It 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 almost felt weird that everything kind of was falling for us uh, at the weekend. It just didn't. It didn't seem right. It still doesn't feel right. Um, it feels like a bit of a dream, but um, thankfully, um, it, it was reality. Uh, on Scott Wright, um, I will cover him briefly because um, it's all he deserves. What did you make of the the two bookings um, for us? Uh, the Alton Lee Zombie sent off. I, if you're a good lip reader, you'll have seen the fact that um, he said for his second yellow, he calls it soft. Um, but I think. He can have absolutely no complaints because he's not been on a booking for me. That's a booking every day of the week. Um, so for me, he really can't complain. Two really kind of cowardly tackles, needless tackles, um, and deservedly gets his marching orders. Uh, yeah, I would say so. I think the first yellow card, um, you probably have seen red cards given for that. I don't know if that's a bit harsh, but... Mm. You probably have him. Certainly, my dad thinks it should have been a red. So there we are. The well, second David one, would... he sent uh, Josh he Mulligan off for a sent off. That's true. Yeah, that's true. He deserves to be sent off for that second one, in my opinion. Um, and good, good. You no, know, the pretendy hard man. It was the first one was certainly a cowardly challenge, and uh, just pleasing. He he came on, replaced Ryan Jack. And then Scott Wright got an absolute schooling from Jack McKenzie, bullied in the short time that he was on the park. And 
just a shame he wasn't out there to enjoy the away and the away fans celebrating and um, come the end of the game, I suppose. Yeah, um, Ryan Jack's been very quiet on, on Instagram as well. Uh, ironic, he doesn't pipe up uh, anymore. Um, I, I spoke about Miofsky having the chance to put us 2 0 up, he didn't convert, um, but we did convert uh, a little bit later. There was a kind of Really, if you want to describe pinball in the box, we'll play that clip before Jamie McGrath smashes it home. You think back to that Miofsky chance, I think Richard Jensen fired at, at Connor Goldson. Now, he was appealing for handball, um, and it was probably only about my sixth viewing of the, the highlights today where I, I noticed um, it definitely does hit Connor Goldson's hand, but we saw last season... Connor Goldson could probably diving save the ball and still wouldn't um, concede a penalty. So whether that one would have been overturned by VAR, thankfully we don't need to, to worry about that. But the chances kept raining down and, and eventually birthday boy Jamie McGrath smashed it home um, to send, I mean, the video of the away end at that second goal. I mean, that is limbs upon limbs. Um, but what a way to, to top off your birthday by um, smashing in a goal um, against Injuries. Oh, you couldn't think of anything better. Um, certainly I couldn't. Anyway, it was chaos in the box, and then it, it was chaos in the stands. And I tell you what, Jamie Grass celebration as well, outstanding. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, made it even better. Um, and tell you what, crack and finish. To be fair, the way the way he he takes that goal. Um, okay, you know, it's it's you know. You would expect him to score from there, but I thought he finished it excellently. And um, you've seen players miss in those kind of situations many a time, and uh, I'm just glad that somebody stuck that ball in the back of it after about six attempts. Yeah, I, I think it was quite clever, and um, the way he kind of hits it into the ground as well. It kind of maybe catches Jack Butland out, and um, slightly probably he was expecting it to be leathered straight at him, but really kind of composed. Um, finish from Jamie and a few of you were kind of having kind of discussion about the the impact that that Jamie McGrath ha has been having and, and one of the responses was from from Kaiser who said about McGrath kind of going up as in up in his estimation he didn't rate him but he's proving him wrong and I think you know he's proving a lot of us wrong and um, a lot of us were rather underwhelmed you just need to kind of go back to some of our our back catalog when you know when you were bo bored in the summer and we're running polls to to keep yourself entertained due to the, the lack of signings um and there really kind of wasn't a great enthusiasm um around jamie coming in but we've managed to you know obviously we're sticking with this formation but we found a position for jamie that we're now getting the best out of him um he's we're kind of playing to that strength that we saw. We're getting this in Mirren, Jamie McGrath, not the Dundee United, Jamie McGrath. Absolutely. And great to him because he's played in a variety of different positions. I mean, against Ross County at Pataudry, he was very much up in support of Boya Miofsky and Duke. And then against Frankfurt and Rangers, he was sort of pushed out in a wide left midfielder role. And excellent both times. I love the versatility. I love the application and the fact he's you know started adding goals to his game hopefully we can continue seeing that if we can continue seeing these this end product from him and not just penalties either in fact no penalties uh, so god knows what happens if he ends up taking them uh, but i am delighted uh, and you know what some great celebrations too so if you could keep them up as well then i'd be very happy yeah um i guess as ever when when you play rangers you, nothing's ever done until that that final whistle goes and i'm sure even at two nil those in attendance will that kind of last 20 25 minutes will have felt like an eternity more so um when kel roos decides to have a moment of utter madness um and forget to actually be a goalkeeper and collapse like a, a house of cards and uh, rangers knock it in there was a var check for a foul um Willie Miller uh, on Sportsman was adamant, uh, along with Leanne Crichton, that there was no foul involved and um, Rose should have done better. Um, you agree, Willie, there? Or were you expecting VAR to, to overturn that? No, I, I do agree. Um, certainly would have been soft, very, very soft. However, you do wonder 
had it been up there at the other end, what would have happened? Um, mm. But no, I think it was poor from Keller. But he's allowed. He's allowed one, I suppose. Um, rather when it's two, when we're two nothing, we go on to win three one anyway. Um, but I was a bag of nerves. Uh, I thought, here we go again. It was flashbacks yeah. from when we were two one up going into added time, and and decided to chuck it away and lose three two. Uh, under a good win, I was terrified. But the way they responded, added another goal, easing the nerves, uh, more jubilant scenes. Um, excellent, I think. But Kelro should have better. It's a slight negative. Yeah. It's a slight negative, but if that's the um, only negative we've got, then we're doing extremely well. And if he's getting that out of his system ahead of Thursday, even better, because um, I'm sure he'll maybe, he'll have a busier night than he did um, on Saturday or on Thursday. Um, I mean, hopefully not. Um, but I think, you know, with the rest of the stuff, uh, I think he dealt with most of the shots um, with ease. You know, I, I think a few folk were kind of commenting on the, the fact that he was maybe pushing some of the shots kind of into the danger zone instead of round the round the post. But, you know, I think Kel kind of really didn't have too much to really worry about. There was obviously the kind of small penalty shout towards the end of the game at 3-1 as well between him and Angus. Um, but again, and for me, not, nothing in that as well. But like I said, just one small kind of blip because um, that would have been a really kind of excellent for, for that defence that's had a lot of kind of criticism or, or doubts uh, aimed at it um, to, to come away from a, a clean sheet as well. You know, I think even Ruby as well, he was out, outstanding. What I love about him is the way he kind of celebrates goals himself um, before joining the, the rest of the team as well. You look at the, the first goal, and I, I think it's the th the second goal, actually. He's just going crazy himself and then realizes, oh, yeah, I'll go and celebrate with everybody else. But, yeah, um, I'm sure we kind of spoke again about Ruby in the preview episode. Will he, won't he? Um start um I'm, I'm sure that game and um, will have done his confidence uh, another great boost i think so i think this whole week week will have and um, i i thought he was he was good there's one instance where rose saved it and then it sort of came back out to him and he just didn't have to sort of direct it to garton and and i thought i like that i like that he seems to be yeah. growing as a player i love the celebrations and i honestly just can't wait to see how mad he goes or what he does. I don't even know if he'll know what to do if slash when he grabs a goal for himself. No, no, he won't. Um, uh, and then, of course, at 2-1, we're probably thinking, as you said, oh, here we go again, or feeling the worst. I was for sure. I thought, don't you fucking dare. Do not. Because um, it was all going swimmingly thinking how good is this going to be on Monday when we have to um, speak about almost backing up how confident we were um, when others kind of had that doubt to um, maybe not be as, as smug as we hope. But Jack McKenzie, um, Doric Roberto Carlos, um, as PGL Tuna calls him, um, capped off what was a, a resounding second half performance by slamming the ball in through Jack Butland off the crossbar and thankfully bouncing the right side of the, the line. Duke catches it um, once it's crossed the line just to make sure there can't be any doubt as well. Um, what a moment for, for Jack as well. As, as we've already, we've already spoken about, he was absolutely superb um, throughout. He's had a lot of criticism for his performances you know, um, so far this season and kind of doubts about is, you know, is he a, is he a first team starter? Um, but came in and capped off with a goal in front of um, the, the Union Bears as well, running behind that goal, not quite pulling off the, the roly-poly. Uh, a lot of people saying similar to what um, Tati did in, in the, the cup final as well. But, you know, that's something I'm sure both of us, I certainly can attest to, have has dreamed about doing slamming a, a goal in in that in that end and getting to run towards a jubilant away end um, along with your teammates stuff that we can only dream about but Jack's managed to tick it off. Absolutely, I'm delighted for him because you know as we mentioned he has come in for criticism as I said sometimes rightly so and um, 
But blessed, he tries. And all of his efforts certainly paid off on Saturday. Um, his, his best performance in an Aberdeen shirt, you would probably say, only his second goal. He seems to only score pretty big goals. I don't really know what's going on. Um, I mean, he was massively helped with his first one uh, away at yeah. Livingston. But he made sure about that one, smashing it in uh, off the underside of the bar. His celebration was so incredibly weird, and if he pulls out sort of the the, the tatty and um, luscious locks next time, then we'll know we'll know for sure. And um, however, it was it was interesting. He just doesn't know what he's doing. And uh, Nicky Devlin's already belted it towards the end. Well, we ended on a massive knee slide, which I loved as well. Yeah. But it it was excellent, and I I wish I had been in that away end uh, to enjoy it and, and the aftermath. But. Full credit to Jack McKenzie. Must that must do him the world of good confidence wise. Um especially he didn't watching Jack McKenzie putting on a show, getting rolled out again. Um interesting, funny. It's all just funny. Just let him enjoy it. It's still a horrible chant uh, either way. Um but, um, but imagine sorry, imagine imagine being a Rangers fan. Jack McKenzie's just made it three one for anyone that was still there, that is. And then all of a sudden, you've got the way saying, watching Jack McKenzie put on a show. You'd be livid. You'll be livid. It's like the park just go boing, boing. Imagine hearing that when you're losing to them. It just added added few. Uh, thoroughly enjoyable. It, it was. It was a thoroughly enjoyable um, afternoon for, for all that were there, but a thoroughly af- enjoyable afternoon for, for all concerned with, with Aberdeen Football Club. And, you know, Calm, we spoke about, you know, we were expected... To, to beat Ross County, let's be be honest, in, in the league last week, and we called Saturday a real kind of benchmark of where we where we were, um, kind of after the, the Frankfurt performance because that was kind of a step up in class, and we've really kind of backed that up, and I think you know it's really added to the, the confidence going into Thursday night's game against Helsinki, which we're just going to come on to in a second, and at time of going live, you know we're sitting with just under a thousand tickets. Um, left for sale, so heading heading for a sell out there. Um, but kind of final point on on Saturday's win. Um, I've got to go back to the, the full time celebrations as well because um, obviously we, we return back to the the Ole, but um, Jack McKenzie fittingly booting the ball high into the the Rangers stands, much to um, Rangers TV commentator Tom's frustration, who Fraser Walsh told me is actually Willie Miller's cousin. Um, there's something. Um, which is mind blowing, but also um, Connor Jurgen Klopp Barron with a huge fist bump at a full time to Aberdeen Loons, just knowing how much it means to to get a win, and I'm sure both of them really savoured that on Saturday night. Absolutely, and as they should. In fact, that's two players that sort of come in for for criticism, I suppose, uh, over let's say the past season or so, and um, two players who have now hopefully sort of turned a corner a little bit. And uh, look, they're doing what we've all dreamed of. And uh, a, a day like Saturday is absolutely for them to enjoy. So delighted for, for the both of them. And um, also just delighted the fact it's early in the season. We've gone to Glasgow. We've won. A lot of the players in that team have not done such a thing. Uh, so to get that so early in this season, to show them that they can do it. Anytime we now go there, whether that be at Parkhead, Celtic Park, uh, that's the same place. Ibrox or Hampton, I mean, um, again, it's one of those two. There's got to be that belief. They've been there and done it before, so why can't mm-hmm. they do it again? Um, excellent to see. And, uh, just on cloud nine, Glenn. Let's just hope this carries on. Exactly. I guess, you know, maybe makes up for some of the, the disappointment um, against not against not taking full points from St. Mirren away or or Livingston away, you know, taking points from a venue, maybe people didn't expect us to, to take all three as well. So these things do even themselves out through the season, to use that age-old cliche. Um, looking ahead to Thursday then, um, I want to pick up on this point that, that Kev Swag made um, earlier um, in the live. Um, when he spoke about the, the team look gelled together now and coming into some, some decent league, league fixtures, need to capitalise on them. But not just the fixtures because we've got as we said that um, huge game against Helsinki coming up on Thursday night as well and this is kind of you know maybe the problem uh, and a good problem for, for Barry Robson as well is what do we do with the starting lineup ahead of Thursday do you stick or twist 
it, it was interesting hearing Willie Miller's thoughts on this because that was posed to him um, by Kenny McIntyre on Sportshound. Uh, and he said he would make a couple of changes, primarily looking at, at bringing Duke back in. Because we're at home, we've got to be playing somebody um, like Duke that can use his pace, his strength, and kind of explosive nature to exploit Helsinki. But it almost feels a bit harsh um, making changes to that starting eleven uh, after such a, you know, excellent performance and result. It does feel harsh. However, ultimately, it's a good chance to get points on the board in the Conference League at home um, against what you think is probably the closest side comparable to us. Um, and as you say, potentially, well, it's heading towards a sellout crowd with only a thousand tickets left. I think we do need to go back to the sort of the shape that we played with uh, against Ross County at home, uh, wherein one of the midfielders constantly getting up in support of Duke Miofsky. Um, less of sort of a flat five, more with the wing backs. Absolutely, when it, when defending, make it a flat five. And if we do need to set up a bank four, that's fine. But we do need to. The, the onus will be more on us. So I don't think mm. we can start with such a negative shape uh, and leave an isolated striker up there because there will be plenty of chances. Um, the crowd will be more than up for it. Let's just hope for once with a big crowd, we are not let down. Yeah, let, let's hope. Uh, kind of thinking then to, to Thursday as well, you spoke there about the onus being on us. The bookies have got us down at, at, as favourites. Um, that's maybe down to Helsinki's poor away form. More on that in, in the chat with Ari just coming up shortly. How do you think we deal with that on, on Thursday, the, the onus being on us? Obviously, the momentum um, with us as well, three wins um, on the bounce. Is there that expectation and, and maybe pressure for the team to kind of come out and uh, assert our early kind of dominance on the on Helsinki and maybe try and get that early goal to, to really keep the crowd going? I don't know because I don't want them to be to feel that pressure and then to sort of overdo it and 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 then that's often when maybe things go wrong because with that big crowd, how many times have we seen it recently where maybe they do feel that pressure and and it gets them or, or they don't play the game that, that if they do then they then they'll win. I think it has to be similar to Ross County where you know maybe possession stats are, are, are relatively similar. But when we are on it, we're looking to make things happen. It's not just possession for possession's sake, controlling the game. It needs to be fast, it needs to be direct, crisp balls into the front two, especially and um, and but supply that service for those two. It'll be Duke and me, obviously, you've got to feel they will score goals when afforded the opportunity. It, and they sort of highlighted it, I guess, on sports scene when Rangers were on the ball and every time the cross were going to the box, but it was play in front of the Aberdeen defence. Mm -hmm. It needs to be when we can get in behind them, behind them, when we can break quickly. And I'd like to think that'll be the case, sort of similar to Ross County at home. I know Helsinki will probably be of a better standard. I think we should have enough to get us over the line. Yeah, again, this is kind of teetering onto that maybe overconfident um, stage um, that we've seen in, in early dom domestic games uh, as well. But the thing is, winning breeds that, that level of confidence. And I think though we should be having that going into this fixture, especially being at home, we're playing the team from the, the pot three. Um, this is... Um, our prime opportunity to, to pick up points in Europe, these home games. And if we want to target progression, the, the games against Helsinki and Pauk this month are golden for us. And, you know, you spoke about October being a, a prime month for us with the fixtures getting easier. I just didn't realise they started uh, in September at Ibrox as well. <laughs> well, that <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't consider that either. I thought if we, you know, get through the cup, pick up three points against Ross County, I did think, you know, we could get something. I was thinking possibly a point, and I would have been delighted with a point, if mm. I'm honest, I'm over the moon with the fact we got three. But the things that must be doing for confidence is, is incredible. And it's a massive month for us, I've, as I sort of alluded to earlier in the show. Um, we've got decent league fixtures, two at home, Dun uh, St. Johnston and then Dundee, and you highlight it there. If we're going to progress, we need to be picking up four points, in, in, in at least in these home games uh, in, in the conference league. 
Yeah, and, and Jay Moyer saying the fact that we can, you know, rest Duke and, and Clarkson uh, against Eintracht Frankfurt and Rangers shows kind of maybe the depth that we're we're producing. Um, do you think Leighton comes back into the side? Um, I guess for me, that's maybe we've spoken about Duke kind of coming in um, or back into the team. What do you think um, Barry will do for, for the middle of the part? Because Dante was excellent against Frankfurt and um, was good again at Ibrox. That's for me the one position to kind of watch with intrigue when the team news comes out if he goes with with Dante or or Connor alongside Graham, shouldn't he? I think that tends to be we're saying that sort of every episode now. Mm -hmm. It's the middle of the park, but the fact we've got options and I wouldn't be disappointed with any of them. It's, it's a fantastic place to be, especially when we thought uh, we were absolutely fucked with you know, with Ramadani. Uh, however, yeah. I think uh, what I would well not me what I think what I would like would be. The three that played uh, at home against Ross County, Baron, Shinny, and then McGrath, who can get up in support of Duke Miofsky and ideally get on the score sheet once again. Mm -hmm. um, left wing back, do you think we just stay with the um, defence that we started with um, at the weekend? Um, or do you, do you see the potential for Johnny Hayes to come in there, that bit of experience head in there? Um. I, I'm not sure. I think there's benefits to both in that um, Johnny Hayes brings that maybe a bit more attacking impetus and maybe not the goal scoring impetus that Jack McKenzie brings nowadays. However, that experience as well um, is it would be an absolute benefit in, in games like this. However, with Jack McKenzie, you're probably getting a bit more defensive solidity. Um, as as Jay mentions, um, it's confidence always sky high. Uh, so in, I would be inclined to sort of lean that way and um, I think he's sort of more astute defensively maybe than Johnny Hayes and um, very physical as well as Connor Goldson well knows after the weekend uh, and seems to be getting better at going forward there's a few times he, he was up there posing threats and involved so I think Mackenzie gets the nod what a world we live in what a world we live in Um. I was joined Calm, by um, Finnish sports journalist Ari Bertanen on Friday to um, give us an insight um, into what we can expect from Helsinki. So whilst I finish my Rangers tears, I will play the video um, of Ari's chat with myself on Friday. Ari, welcome on to Red Tinted Glasses and thank you very much for joining me this Friday um, afternoon. Uh, you're a couple of hours ahead of us over in Finland. I'm sure looking forward to the weekend. A, a rare weekend off um, for HJK. They're not playing this weekend. Um, is that the, the Finnish league helping them by um, keeping their weekend clear ahead of the European game on Thursday or were Helsinki always set not to play this weekend? Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Always uh, nice to talk about Finnish football with uh, foreign friends. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, well, I was going to the gym, so that's <laughs> the reason why I'm wearing these clothes. Uh, and then after that, playing some futsal with uh, with friends later in the evening. But yeah, uh, you're right. Um, um, Finnish FA and and uh, uh, league board has uh, given uh, a flexible uh, schedule for these clubs who are participating in in European competitions. Uh, so uh, that's the reason why uh, why they don't have match at this point. Also, mm, disclaimer: it might also uh, factor that. Uh, there's a Finnish Cup final this week and uh, in Helsinki, so oh, okay. uh, that's another factor in this uh, uh, schedule. Uh, but yeah, they they are resting now, and they they had a pretty tight schedule. Um, mm -hmm. It ended uh, a couple of days ago uh, when they won uh, crucial match uh, in Helsinki and that was their third match in a six days uh, so they had pretty hectic uh, week and a half and now they are resting uh, three days 
and then uh, uh, getting back to the uh, home pitch on Sunday uh, to to start training uh, for Aberdeen away match. Yeah, um, uh, Aberdeen obviously also having a, a busy schedule as well uh, after the, the Frankfurt game, the double header against Ross County, and we travel to, to Rangers this weekend. Of course, we're recording this segment, as I said, on Friday afternoon. Um, this match, she's the third pot side in, in Helsinki, come against uh, up against the bottom um, pot side, which was, of course, us. What is the view over in Helsinki looking at this match? Because over here in Aberdeen, Helsinki is the, the team we would be looking at um, trying to, to get a victory against uh, in European competition, especially with this game being at home here in Aberdeen. Is there an expectation over in Finland that um, Helsinki are expected to travel to Aberdeen on Thursday night and win the match as well? I could pretty much repeat what you said. <laughs> <laughs> just replace Aberdeen with HAK. So maybe HAK is also looking for these Aberdeen matches and they see they, these matches as uh, as the matches where they can get something from these games because uh, it is, after all, a pretty hard group. Mm -hmm. Hard to get something out of it. Uh, uh, Frankfurt, obviously huge club and then Park, uh, uh, pretty, pretty big club in in Greece. So um, I guess we are the underdogs uh, yeah. here, <laughs> Aberdeen and, and HAK. And I think both clubs performed admirably uh, in their in their first outing of the group. Unfortunately for both of us, uh, ended in defeat. You did mention before we started recording this segment that. Um, after the Aberdeen game, there isn't a chance that uh, HJK could um, win the win the league um, over in Finland. So I wonder if there's maybe going to be some slight distraction um, of that looking at the game on Thursday with with winning the league in, in mind. But if we focus on Europe for the time being, could you give us a little insight into what it was like for Helsinki last time out against Pauk? Because obviously you guys took the lead but ultimately ended in defeat 3-2 to the visitors. Unfortunately, we've not been able to see uh, any highlights over here to kind of give us a, a look up to what it might have been like playing on the European stage. I think some of the domestic highlights are, are available for us, but obviously European football tends to maybe be played at a different pace to, to domestic. Well, it wasn't surely a bad performance uh, from HAK. It was maybe just one of those matches where they fought valiantly and then in the end uh, suffered a defeat against a bigger opponent. Uh, so uh, they they uh, they had a, a pretty big uh, or massive misfortune in the beginning of the match when uh, number one goalkeeper, former national team goalkeeper Niki Manpa, who has also played in in UK, um, suffered an injury that will most likely keep him out uh, for a few weeks, and uh, that happened really. It was it tenth minute when he was injured, and then uh, carried away on twelfth minute, and then. Uh, but after that, uh, the first half was pretty pretty good from HAK. Uh, they they defended well, and they uh, counterattacked it uh, pretty well, and uh, and they managed to get uh, some set pieces, and then uh, one of them resulted uh, to an goal of leading 1-0 goal and then after that um well first half i'd say the feeling was like a bit surprised that mm. it's hak actually playing this well <laughs> against park and uh that was what we were talking about in the media media stand and uh but then uh Second half, uh, there were some uh, um, mm, 
unlucky mistakes and mm-hmm. and and uh, as usual when they are consecutive mistakes they lead into a goal and then there was a equalizer and then uh mm, yeah, I forgot to mention that actually before the equalizer, uh, uh, HAK had uh, like a huge chance uh, and a, uh, shot against the goalpost. So mm-hmm. that possible 2 nil goal could have changed uh, the drama or dynamics of the game. But sure. anyways, uh, equalizer came and then, then uh, Park... Got the leading goal as well, and uh, and the third one, and then in the end, uh, HAK got this consulting second goal. So if I that that was it, if I remember correctly, I I was at the <laughs> match, but uh, <laughs> there's so many matches during the year that you you forget about the details after a while. But um, yeah, all in all. Uh, I'd say it, it wasn't a bad performance. It, and it, yeah, just ask, please. Yeah, no, hear, hearing you speak um, about that game kind of draws a lot of similarities f- for me to the way Aberdeen performed in Frankfurt in terms you mentioned maybe a kind of a, a surprising performance. Uh, I think that was very much the same for us o- over in Germany. Um, <clears throat> and I heard you use the, the way that the HJK counterattacked um, against the Greeks. Do you think that's something that they'll look to do um, when they come to Aberdeen as well and um, try and kind of hit Aberdeen on the counter-attack or do you th- feel that they'll have a different kind of style and approach given this is an away game? I think and I believe that HAK's uh, aim is to get something out of their counter-attacks. Uh, counter-attacking football style has been their modus operandi in European games uh, for some time um, against bigger opponents uh, because there's there's maybe just not enough quality to uh, get the ball control and uh, possession in these games uh, with HAK's team. So um, I'd expect uh, I'd expect uh, HAK to defend in a relatively low block press at times um, in different kinds of situations when it makes sense and then uh, try to hurt Aberdeen with with counter attacks and and they have uh, suitable players uh, for uh, those attacks because they have a couple really really fast uh, players uh, in their attacking line like uh, uh, I could mention first uh, Topi Keskinen, this young player who's playing his uh, first season in Finnish league. Uh, last season he played in, in second tier, and uh, he has uh, surprised pretty much everyone here that he's uh, adapted so well to Finnish league and and also shown that uh, playing in in European matches is not a problem for him. Mm-hmm. And uh, after the last home match uh, in, in in Finnish league, uh, after the game, uh, when I interviewed him, he told me when I asked about his top speed that uh, it's been measured uh, actually in that part game. It was measured to be 36 kilometers per hour. And that's like, as you know, uh, like, uh, like uh, European top level speed of a player like uh players like maybe like Kyle Walker or mm. Haaland or Mbappe could be a tiny bit faster but he's really fast and he uh, in in that match in that last home match uh, he made uh, a brilliant goal where he picked up the ball uh at the edge of the own penalty area ran uh all the way to the attacking third uh dodged one sliding tackle on the way and then uh 
finished is like 85 meters long run yeah. by putting that ball into the back of the goal yeah there's definitely threats that um that we've got to watch out for i'm sure by rob's had a, um scouts over watching some some recent games i'm sure including that that game against Pauk as well you've mentioned um him there i'll come to it just now then since we're speaking about uh, about players um, where do you feel um, HJK can, can hurt Aberdeen uh, in terms of players? Um, I noticed both Bojan Radulovic and Burima Hassan Bande um, both seem to be quite prolific just now uh, in, in front of goal. Um, so obviously they're a, a threat that we've got to watch out for, but um, would there be other players on top of both of them that we have to watch out for? I would say that those three that you mentioned... Uh well including topic eskin and i told about uh, they are the main threats uh, uh eskin and plays usually on the left flank hasan ebande has been on left or right flank and uh radulovic plays as a center so uh radulovic is a slow target player okay. uh actually not that good as a target player but more like a big poacher and mm. uh has scored a lot of goals 17 in, in finnish league this season hasan ebande was once uh bought by uh ajax amsterdam okay. and uh and uh ha has had some uh misfortune in his career but now he's mm. uh trying to use uh, hak as a springboard to a new phase of his career like uh in, in the past some other players have used hak like maybe you know alfredo morelos uh in, <laughs> in, in scotland and uh he came from hak so hak has this uh, uh pedigree of uh, uh developing or giving uh chances to players who are in a bad uh place in their careers at some point and uh hasan abande is is quite a uh, quite exciting player at the moment um uh, i reckon uh, and i understood that they didn't expect that much uh, from him this mm. season and they are mostly looking uh for the next season that then then he can be a really impact player but now he has already shown his impact in few matches mm. Yeah. <clears throat> what sort of formation do HJK tend to go with? Um, and do you expect that formation to, to remain the same um, in this game on Thursday? Or do you expect them to, to make any changes to, to that formation and, and maybe the team as well? Uh, they have a variety of formations that they could use, of course, but... Um, mm, um most likely there will be three center backs uh wing backs and then uh possibly uh uh three in the middle and one of those uh, uh three midfield players could also uh be kind of like a winger depending on the situation mm -hmm. um so they'll be cautious and uh they have a good defense uh, there's a couple ex -na national team players of finland there mm -hmm. and uh also there's there's plenty of uh, uh like uh, um how should i put it uh, like uh, fringe players of yeah. the national team in the team uh yeah. other players as well um all together maybe like uh, half a dozen uh, uh players who have uh played in the national teams within within a couple of years yeah well, i'm sure um Barry's speaking to richard jensen of course who um we signed this summer finnish national uh, team center back to get some some insight into those fringe players and those players that have been in and around the the national team as well when I look at the the domestic form of HJK, they're, they're very impressive in terms of goals scored. I think forty seven so far this season domestically, two defeats. 
um, as I mentioned about, about the draws. But in terms of European fixtures, away from home has been a real struggle from HJK. Um, they've failed to win this season away from home in Europe. They've only drawn one of those games, and that was against Larne from um, Northern Ireland. That was 2-2. Uh, again, it was uh, quite late-minute goals in, in that game as well. Is there? What would you put that down to, or is there anything that they struggle with when they play outside of Finland? Hmm. Well, generally, I would say that for HAK away games have always been difficult. Okay. Uh, if we look at the look at the scores uh, from the recent history. Uh, there are hardly any 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 good uh, away results. Uh, um, last season, uh, they they managed to uh, get a good result uh, from Denmark uh, and uh, against Silkeborg, and uh, and with mm -hmm. that, uh, they went to Europa League. Okay. But but they are rare instances where uh, where they get something from away games. Uh, we we. In these conversations, uh, I have to stress that uh, HAK is still relatively small fish in these competitions compared yeah. to uh, the clubs they, they face. Like uh, this uh, summer, they played against uh, Karabakh, uh, which is uh, big big team in their country and uh, also Molde which is uh, really big and and has a solid team uh, no stars but you know Norwegian <coughs> Norwegian uh, uh, efficiency and uh, it's just hard to get results <laughs> for any team uh, uh, yeah. in away games uh, uh, unless you are one of the big boys, uh, or or in this group, if, if you're Eintracht Frankfurt. Yeah, no, totally. And I obviously Aberdeen have had the experience against Karabag and been on the end of a disappointing result against them. And I saw the the score against Molden. That's kind of not to be, um, you know, looked looked down at because, as you say, they are a difficult team to come up across. One thing I did note. And maybe something that Barry Robson will be kind of looking at as well is the fact that in all those um, European away games, uh, HJK conceded in the last 10 minutes of all those games. Um, and I know Barry Robson prides himself on having a fit team. We saw already this season when we played um, Haken over in Gothenburg, um, kind of the way that <clears throat> Aberdeen kicked on in the last 15, 20 minutes when uh, Haken were maybe tiring. A few fans have pointed to the fact that HJK are already well through their season uh, in comparison to Aberdeen. Do you think that does have a factor in this game when it comes to maybe the last 15, 20 minutes that uh, HJK are maybe likely to tire more than Aberdeen? Mm, could be, could be, but uh, it's kind of like a, there are bonuses and then there are, you know, minuses to this yeah. situation uh, like obviously they are uh very fit and and they they uh have plenty of games behind so so that helps but then again some players uh, might feel the burden of the season at this point so but it it's up to like individual players uh maybe it could be a little bit of problem to some inexperienced players, but mm -hmm. more experienced players can handle these situations better. Yeah. Um, in terms of an Aberdeen point of view, as I said, obviously we're looking at this game probably the, the same way that, that fans of HJK are looking at it, that it's a winnable tie for us. For... Um, fans of Aberdeen, could you give us an insight into where it might be possible that, that Aberdeen can cause problems for JK? Is there any weakness that, that we could look to exploit in this game from your um, point of view? Hmm. 
Well, uh, if I think about it, sometimes they have had some issues, uh, like what comes to defending, uh, like fullback wing back areas okay mm, sometimes they've been mm, they've been hurt from uh, dead ball situations like park executed a really well their corner kick and then uh, yeah they they should have defended that one better so okay. um, I'm not aware how good Aberdeen is in, in uh, set pieces, but maybe <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. But well, it's certainly, you know, hearing about the, the kind of wing back area, that's something that on our day, uh, it, it, you kind of going back to what you mentioned about your formation, the, the formation that you kind of indicated uh, HJK might begin the game with is, a, a formation that Aberdeen have been using this season with three at the back and, and wing backs, uh, a midfield three, and then um, kind of one, two up top. We, we changed that slightly um, with kind of more going one up top and flooding the midfield more against Frankfurt. But I just wonder <clears throat> kind of what our tactic will be with this game being at home. But um, I, I think we'll play a lot of passing possession football and, and try and work the ball in behind the de defense to then utilize Boyan Miofsky in the middle who's obviously in some, some good form just now and will look to be continuing that that form um on Thursday night as well Ari I'm coming to to Helsinki in, in November and there's a lot of Aberdeen fans booked up See for yes yeah, so I'm looking forward to it and um, I, I think there's talk of a, maybe about 900 fans coming over in November. How, how many fans are, are you aware that are making the trip to, to Aberdeen um, this week? Um, I've got no idea, but let's say that maximum some tens of fans, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say that uh, Aberdeen is a tempting destination. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that... Uh, uh lure some fans to go there but uh maybe this isn't such a big uh occasion uh, otherwise like uh, maybe some people are saving money for the trip to frankfurt uh, mm -hmm. there were uh, quite a many, quite many fans in in rome last fall when, when uh, hak played against the uh, as roma so we'll see but there are there are always some some uh, devoted fans who will mm -hmm. will go to these matches. Yeah, I, I noticed it looks like Helsinki are getting the the traditional uh, away end up Tawdry this Thursday, which indicates there is a, a decent number making the, the trip from Helsinki. Looking ahead quickly to that trip in November, what can Aberdeen fans expect from the the trip in November, other than the fact that it will be extremely cold when when we come across start saving your money <laughs> <laughs> the pints are more expensive than in aberdeen uh, but otherwise you know november it's not that bad time um probably not snow on the ground uh probably hopefully uh dry crispy weather and uh i think uh you like it in Helsinki. It's uh, uh, I've heard outsiders say that it's a beautiful, beautiful city. Yeah, I mean, from the pictures that I've seen, it it looks beautiful. I, I noticed that there's a Helsinki version of the the London Eye when I was doing some research this week. So I'll be um, scouting that out. There's a Granite City London Eye for any Helsinki fans coming over this week if they want to have a look at, at that as well. But I hope any um, Helsinki fans that have been tuning into um, this episode have um, enjoyed hearing myself and Callum's thoughts um, on the game uh, on Thursday and they enjoy their, their trip over to the, the Granite City um, as well. And Ari, I just want to, to thank you as well for your time this Friday afternoon to give us a, a small insight into 
um, what we can expect on Thursday. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Callum, that was Ari there giving us his insight into what we can expect from Helsinki. So he says that, that you know, the free weekend was down to the, the Finnish league, giving them a, a helping hand. But of course, one eye potentially um, on winning the league. So hopefully a bit of distraction coming into, into play there. Um, feel more confident after hearing that? I mean, a bit a bit vague on, on, on some of the answers, but um, it's, it's, it's helped giving us some form of insight. I mean, I I didn't know anything about them prior, so it's it's good to learn some stuff, I suppose. Uh, interesting to hear about their threats. The players fa- faster than Bappe, um, that's a concern for me, massively. <laughs> However, uh, reassuring, uh, I suppose, with the injury to their goalkeeper, um, it'll be interesting to see how how their backup does. I mean, I know I would be a lot less confident if it was us in that position. Um, Mm -hmm. However, who knows? Who knows? I'm I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Um, It'll be interesting to see how many fans they have over. Um, Some tens of fans. That was what was vague. Um, But who knows what to expect? Ari's keeping his cards close to his chest, according to Michael Taylor. I agree uh, a Mm -hmm. little bit, but hey, it's a bit of insight. It's better than what we could have given anyone, I suppose. Yeah, it, exactly. As well, you know, uh, you know, credit to these guys that that agreed to come on the podcast as well. Obviously, English probably not Ari's first language as well. So I think you know, for some of the times when maybe he was trying to articulate his points, it was difficult to try and get get the right words out. I mean, Jesus, we we struggle to articulate our words um, at the best of times as well. So fitted in well, um, um, exactly. Um, Christopher Mainland p- bringing up that point as well, not processing your thoughts in a, a, another language. Um, Calm, you had a bit of breaking news um, potentially um, coming out uh, as Ari was was speaking, so we'll include that before we um, wrap up the show tonight. Absolutely, um, it was tweeted tonight by uh, the infamous Harold Ingol- Ingolfson. No, we can't even do that. So uh, AFC on Twitter that apparently. Slobodan Rubicic is set to receive his first international call-up and will represent Montenegro, um, which is interesting. Didn't know he could do that. However, complicated politics over in that region of the world, so I'm not sure how it quite works out. However, uh, I make that... Well, he's probably... Our, was he, would he have been our first Serbian? Or would you class Nikola Vujadinovic as that? Um, he'll certainly be our second Montenegrin because Nikola Vujadinovic... Played for the under twenty ones. So, um, congratulations to Slobodan. I think that can only be a good thing. Um, he'll be playing with high quality players. You would think um, it'll boost his value uh, to us being an international. And just nice to see he's getting that recognition with his upturn in form. Yeah, exactly. That'll help his confidence. I thought you were a way to start naming some of the Montenegrin national team. But then you quickly bailed out and went for high quality players uh, instead. So um, fair play uh, on that. Um, really looking forward to, to Thursday night um, uh, as well. Thank you very much to all of you that have tuned in to, to the show tonight and stuck with it um, for the full hour and just over 15 minutes as well. It's slightly longer than we um, usually run these lives. But of course, we needed to, to fit in the, the thoughts of Ari to give us um, a bit more of a um, perspective on, on Helsinki, as Calm says, better than what we could have offered uh, on there. So enjoy the game if you're going along on Thursday night. Well, we'll be back as well with our, our reaction to that um, game on Thursday and looking ahead to the visit of St Johnston as we start um, a run of back-to-back um, home games uh, as well. So really looking forward to that and as well. Thanks for watching.